1990, Katherine Coulson became an international cult icon as the Log Lady in the groundbreaking television series, Twin Peaks. But who was the woman who brought the Log Lady to life? Who was the woman who triumphed on stage, screen, behind the camera and in life? Who 25 years later fought off a terminal illness just long enough to play the Log Lady one last time for one of the world's greatest directors, her lifelong friend, David Lynch? I think we both knew it was the last time we were going to talk to each other. Why was shooting these final scenes so important to them? David, if you're going to do this thing, you better do it now. And you better do it down here, because she's not going anywhere. It was a powerful night. Today, we're inviting you to join us in making a feature-length documentary, I Know Catherine, the Log Lady, because the show must go on. Ready the Red Room? Twin Peaks is coming back. David Lynch's Lynchian, because that's really the only adjective to describe it, series about a murder in a small logging town is making a return after 26 years. Showtime announced the new season over two years ago, and it almost slipped through their fingers when Lynch walked away from the project briefly. But that axe has been buried, and the Twin Peaks revival premieres with a two-hour episode on May 21st at 9 p.m. A network boss even called the new season pure heroin David Lynch, which we can only imagine looks like this. And welcome to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is Brian Kazaska. And we've got John Thorne, author of The Essential Wrapped in Plastic and Blue Rose Magazine. Hey, John. Hey, guys. Good to talk to you. If you're listening to today, it's actually the one-year anniversary of Showtime Season 3, Twin Peaks. So I thought it'd be fun to talk with you about you know the year in review. Yeah, that sounds great. It's, it's hard to believe it's been a year. It went by fast. It did. I mean, Very and, fast. and just even building up to this time, it's really exciting that you got to go to the premiere. It was two days before the actual uh, Sunday night premiere, so it was Friday night, the nineteenth of May. It was the two-hour Hollywood premiere in LA, shown on the big screen with the whole cast. Well, most of them and the crew and Lynch and Frost. It was amazing. It really yes, was. So I forgot Lynch was there too. Of course he was there, but yeah. that's kind of crazy to think he was there. And so, what did you get? Like an email from Mark Frost and say, "Hey, you want to come along to the premiere?" I probably told this story already, but now that a year has passed, I can maybe give you a few more details. I, I'm not exactly sure how it all came about somebody asked me on twitter i think have you been invited to the premiere and i tweeted back and i said my mailbox is empty as of now <laughs> whenever this was and then somebody copied mark frost on that and wow. said mark frost uh, look at this you know come on wrapped in plastic or something something like oh. that i saved all the tweets and uh, i thought that was nice for someone to acknowledge me and and i, I don't know if it was within a day I got an email from Mark Frost Aww. that said, "Says you got to keep this, you know, secret, but I am working hard to get you uh, a ticket. I can get you one ticket, and that's it, to the premiere in L.A." Yeah, of course, you know, my head started spinning, <laughs> and I was like, "Why? Well, I don't believe it." And then uh, I think a day later, I got the official invitation to go, and with the NDA that you had to electronically sign and all that. Yeah, that was. I remember very, very clearly the day I got that was May fourth because it was uh, Star Wars Day, so. so <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Uh, you know, I think it's what so a great name. Star Wars awesome. Day present. Yeah. Twin Peaks. <laughs> I think it's so funny, you know, your partner of Blue Rose Magazine, Scott Ryan. You know, so you go, you actually get to go to this event, and then you have Scott Ryan kind of like hanging outside of the theater. Yes, I know. <laughs> Scott taking <laughs> stealthy photos yeah. and kind of look awkward and stuff. It was great, actually, because Scott was in L.A. for a different event. He uh -huh. was there, for I think, for a Buffy the Vampire Slayer uh, event that was being held on that weekend. So he just happened to be in L.A. And I stayed at the hotel where they actually had the theater attached to for the for the premiere, and they they cordoned off the whole street. So unless you were a guest of that hotel or a part of the Twin Peaks premiere, you couldn't get into that street. But because I was a guest, I could get Scott in. And so Scott came in, and and his wife came in, and there outside the hotel there was a little cafe where you could sit outside and just watch all the actors walk by. And so Scott so cool. was there. It was really great. It was nice he could do that. In fact, I think he may have had more interaction with. Some of them uh, than I did. It was just 
so much fun. It was a, a special time, and, and I'm very grateful to Mark Frost for thinking of me and uh, bringing me to that because it, yeah, it was just something I'll never forget. You know, you waited for over 25 years, and here you are in this theater with all these people who made the new season, and to actually all of a sudden see new footage, I mean, what was that like? I mean... Yeah, it was surreal. I mean, it really wasn't, it was just, it was amazing. Um, I really wasn't sure what to expect either. I, mean, I think we were all in that place because we knew so little about it. And, you know, we just didn't know what they were going to do. And I was just open-minded. I said, well, whatever it is, it is. And, you know, the, it started and suddenly there's this black and white footage of the giant as we knew him and Cooper. And I was like, well, here we go. <laughs> it was mesmerizing. I, I'd been thinking about Twin Peaks for so many years and suddenly to be you know, back in the story again. I always also felt a little bit like work too. I, and that, hmm. I, I don't mean that in any bad way, but you know, it's like, okay, I have to process all, all of this. And I don't know who some of these characters are. And when you've had so many years to think about it uh, and, and, you know, study it, uh, suddenly when you're inundated with all this new data, you know, it's a little overwhelming. But, well, it was great. And I'm sure you guys felt the same way when you saw it, uh, yeah. you yeah. know, just two days later. It wasn't a reboot, but there still was a concern that, like, okay, they're going to water this down so that people who aren't as familiar with Twin Peaks, they're going to get play catch up and they're going to, you know. But it wasn't that. It was, like, for the true fans. So true. And think back on that Sunday night because we got the two hours that had shown already in L.A. But then we got two more hours if you watched it on the streaming service that Showtime had. So in effect, we were getting four new hours of Twin Peaks in one night. That, I think, was a decision of Showtime's part because I think which just what you're saying, Ben, is that the show wasn't holding anybody's hands. It yeah. really kind of dumped mm. you in. And if you were familiar with Twin Peaks, you probably were okay. But if you thought, I'm going to check this out and see what it is. <laughs> well, I watched the show once a long time ago right. and I, I'll see what's going on. I think Showtime was hoping you'd stick through to uh, part four yes. so that some of what you might have remembered if you were a casual fan would start to come you know to make some sense or appeal to you yeah that was a lot to take in in one night right. four hours yeah. and, weeks. So, and so brian you only watched the, the two hours and because you wanted to watch it week yeah, to week i did which is cool i yeah, think that was great yeah. i couldn't wait i waited too long i waited over 25 years i couldn't wait i did watch four hours it was a bad the next day was pretty bad for me because <laughs> so john i mean <laughs> we, we ben and myself we come into the studio to record Ben already knows three and four. He's like, I can't say, I can't say. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, I'm trying to be a purist here. I just want it taken in enjoy in chunk. It, enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, because I I felt personally, I'd be like, next week, I'm not going to have anything to look forward to. And granted, I will look forward to it even though I saw it, but it won't be a surprise. Yeah. I already know it. And then a friend of mine came into our studio that was doing something else. He watched all four episodes. And then he's about to talk about it, and we're like, no, I didn't watch it. And he's like, why? And he's yelling at me, why didn't you watch it? was a rough day and afterwards. You were, you were staying away from social media for the week. Didn't yeah, you? I didn't go on social media at all. I'm not sure it was the best decision on Showtime's part. And it's a year later, and I don't yeah. think there's anybody there who's, <laughs> who's going to get upset at you know, uh, saying that. But I stayed up late to watch it, and um, I, I, to be honest with you, you know, I was just so tired. Of course, I been flying i'd yeah. been back and forth to la and i was just like what's going on <laughs> it was a lot to process and if you were processing it late at night which i imagine a lot of people were yeah. I mean, a lot of people you know they have kids they got to get them to bed and so they're staying up late to watch this and if you're up till 1 2 a.m and you've got to get up early the next day it was a lot to take in i just had to re-watch three and four pretty much quickly after I had seen them to really get what was going on. Yeah. I mean, right. I mean, not that I could get it, but to see where the story was going. Yeah. I, I think on a Showtime, I think it's a business. It was a business thing and going with the times. It was like right. week to week, but hey, we can get you to get onto our streaming service. That's we're going to yeah. use the show to sell it. And for the younger crowd who likes to binge things, you get right. to binge four episodes. And this is nothing yeah, for you mm -hmm. because you do it all the time. Yeah. You know? So I kind of look at it like there's so many factors that Showtime was using to hook you know a younger generation and the older crowd and different types and it worked yeah i guess yeah. they were doing their best to build an audience for that and it was a tough thing to do because it's been 25 years and series was it a event. limited series event was yes. that what the yes. now what the blu-ray is called right. they didn't call it season three they didn't want to call it season three right. the return because 
The yeah. Return, of course. They called it The Return, and the, yeah. the and the Blu-ray is called the Limited Series Event, and no one wants to call it Season 3, but I believe Sabrina Sutherland and David Lynch call it Season 3, and that's right. kind of how well, I they just call it. Or you and, and Mark Frost, they call it Twin Peaks. Yeah, yeah. They haven't even ever said well, right. the season, which sure. is kind of confusing, too. <laughs> but yeah, John, I remember you saying that you were going to watch it by yourself – Pretty much was that true week to week? Did you pre- – it was just you watching it with no one else? Oh, my wife and I yeah. watched it. You know, she, she was, was there at the beginning when we were watching yeah. Twin Peaks way back when, and she was really into it as well. Uh, and so, yeah, it was just the two of us. You know, I couldn't get my kids to watch it. My kids are pretty much grown, but, you know, I'm interested in it, so yeah. better not. And uh, <laughs> that's the way that was going to go. Wow. The only time I watched it with a group was uh, – obviously, I, I saw it you know, with a bunch of people in LA, but then I did see, I think it was part 12 at the Palmer house, Mary and Tim Reaver's house in Everett, Washington. And I was with a small group of diehard fans there and saw an episode on Sarah Palmer's TV, which was really, really, <laughs> really cool. Very was, meta. And I'm trying to remember, was it, there was a, there was a Sarah Palmer scene in that episode. It, and Hawk shows up. Right, it, was, it was absolutely surreal. Yeah. yeah because yeah. we hadn't seen much of the house up till then. And I had never been to the house. That was the first time I had ever been and so I went up the stairs and through the door and I'm looking around and we sat down to watch the show and then in the show Hawk pulls up outside and comes up the stairs and knocks on the door and you know you almost wanted to turn to the door to you know see, he's really here and, you know it's just another great experience of being able to see Twin Peaks in a really unique way I realized in seasons maybe one and two the house when they show the Palmer's house it is – just correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know. I, when they show it, it's different from it is, Firewalk yes. With Me and the pilot. Yes. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Yeah, they used a different establishing shot for the Palmer House. Okay. I thought it was in, crazy. Uh, in the hour-long episodes of season one and season two. To the pilot, they shot on location. Firewalk with me, they shot on location, and season three, they shot on location. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think everything else was just an establishing shot that they got somewhere, and of course, a set gotcha. that they built for the living room and all that. Because the establishing shot is very, well, I, I would say, radically different. Because I notice it every time. Like that's not the Palmer House. It, I don't know yeah. where that shot is, maybe from the backyard or some other angle, or a completely house. different house. Different house. And I think it's a completely different house, okay. and I, I I forget. I'm sure I could look it up somewhere, and I'm sure someone like Josh Eisenstadt would know and tell yeah. you exactly, you know, where that that shot was taken. Okay. And but uh, yeah, it's a different house. All right, that's what I thought, and I I thought it was crazy, and I'm trying to think about is this the backyard? <laughs> like, where? Why would they do this? Like. <laughs> I don't know what the backyard looks like. That could be it. I mean, it was just it, it, every time now I notice it. And yeah. I didn't notice it before. I, right. I didn't know anything. And now it yeah. it sticks out like a sore thumb every time right. we see it. <laughs> and you and I got to go to yes. the fest and to see uh, John, to see Scott, and so many of our friends to actually all be there at the fest and to be able to see the actors and the crew. And, and watch episode 12. And I, yeah, watch episode 12. It was really special. It, was like, I, it seems like once-in-a-lifetime chance to be able to ha- – Actually, see Twin Peaks while it's still on. It and truly be in this was. Environment of yeah. Where they shot it, and it was, it was pretty cool. It was yeah, it was very else. cool. Yeah, I think it is probably once in a lifetime. I, I'm not completely optimistic <laughs> that there's going to be a season four uh, for lots of reasons. You know, it probably was a once in a lifetime thing to have the Twin Peaks Festival happening while a brand new episode was about to air and people yeah. could sort of experience it all for the first time together. Mm-hmm. A unique situation. What are you taking away for week after week? Like, I'll tell you for myself, I almost felt like Mark Frost and David Lynch would, like, I don't have a polite way of saying this, kind of screwing us at times in a way that, like, they were, they were messing with us at times. Like, okay, Cooper's going to wake up this week. He's going to wake up this week. And he just, like, the games they play. Even that, you think of episode 12, where he Cooper's in it for one second, or Dougie Cooper, yeah. where he gets hit in the head. And it's like, oh, come on. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's so funny, isn't it? I mean, um, I've talked about this in other places and written about it a little bit because we we watched Twin Peaks over the summer of 2017 in a way that will probably never happen again for anyone. I suppose you could create the conditions and find someone who's never watched it and say you can only watch it you know, week <laughs> to week for 18 weeks or whatever. That's pretty unlikely. And so we were experiencing it 
you know, a part a week, pretty much over that course of that four months. That was a unique way of seeing it. I think it was deliberate on the part of Frost and Lynch. They wanted us to experience it that way. But from now on, a new viewer who comes to it's going to see it faster. Yeah, they may not yeah. binge it, but they can watch it you know, two episodes a night every week if they want, or they can, you know, there's all different ways to watch it. And so that experience of watching it a different way, I think will be very much different because you won't feel that frustration that, you know, why is it taking so long? Because it won't be as long. That being said, I will say that by the time we got to like episode 12 or 13, I was like, okay, we're with Dougie. I don't, you know, this is, they're committed to it now. Mm -hmm. And so I just sort of let it happen. You know, I didn't push back against the show saying, you know, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. I'm like, it's going to do what it's going to do. And so I just took it in and accepted it for what it was every week. How was your feeling about the ending? The show ended and I actually was swearing at the TV. My first (laughs) response was I was angry. I remember that. I know. I was like, what the? Are you serious? This is how it's going to end? I liked it. And I watched it three (laughs) times in a row. You did watch it three times. I was up to one. Yeah, that night I watched both episodes back to back, back to back, back to back. You know, we're texting back and forth and Ben's like, I can I can tell he's aggravated and I don't know every time I watched it I noticed something different and I was like, oh, my God. And, like, the next day I was thinking about it. And and at the same time, yeah. it's funny that, lo- like, like, it has a little bit of a Lost Highway feel to it, which mm. I, is my favorite Lynch film. So you think I would appreciate that. But I think there was so much buildup. And you think, oh, we're going to learn about more about Judy or we're going to resolve Laura. Or there's all these things that, like, there's all these threads. What happened to Red? Like, yeah, all yeah, these yeah, yeah. Threads, and, like, they didn't answer really any of those things. Have you changed your mind about it? Um, you know, you said you were frustrated uh, and even upset the first night, but how do you feel about it now? You still frustrated, or I, I feel better about it. Maybe because I can enjoy it for the theories. I can enjoy it kind of the same way I enjoy episode twenty nine now. You know, in episode twenty nine is like what Cooper's possessed by Bob or whatever. He, you know, <laughs> mm. at the time it was like you can't end it that way. And now years later, you could say, well. What a great ending, or what you know, what retrospect, ending. yeah. So, I mean, I yeah. think I don't mind it as much. I still don't want to let go of Twin Peaks, and I still want to ble- hold, hold hope for season, season four. <laughs> we always talk about that, uh, John. <laughs> Me and Ben, I, I'm like you, I kind of go, I don't, I think that's a good ending. If it ended, it makes sense, it's the end, yeah. And I'm like, I mean, I'm happy. And then ending. Ben's like, no, Brian, there's gotta be more. I will say that I was kind of shocked by the ending. Um, I don't know why, uh, because I said throughout. The, you know, the weeks and months of the summer, I was like, well, you know, I always said there's going to be a Mulholland Drive moment. That's mm. what Scott and I called it, where it was just going to twist on itself and we were going to, it was going to be completely new. Mm. I was expecting that. I guess I'd forgotten about it after a while because <laughs> it was so long and the Mulholland Drive moment, you know what I mean when I say that, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. you know, it's it, Two hours into Mulholland Drive, suddenly it seems like we're in a completely different world and a completely different story. Definitely. I was expecting that to happen. I just was expecting it to happen, I think, much sooner than essentially part 18. Mm-hmm. I think if it if it had happened much sooner, I would have adjusted to it and uh, had some more time to kind of get my mind around it. But it happened in the last episode, essentially. You know, 17 and 18 were shown on the same night. You know, it was a shock, and it wasn't something you could make sense of, not that you even can now, but you, you couldn't really make sense of what was happening when it, you know, when you saw it for the first time. It, it really did leave you wanting, and it, it did seem to be like uh, – Maybe it was a missed opportunity. They didn't, you know, close it up. But I remember that night thinking, you know, this is probably something that's going to resonate for a long, long time. It's really got a lot going on in it. It's purposely ambiguous. And in a way, it honors sort of the the whole essence of Twin Peaks over the last 25 years, which it was incomplete. We were left with a cliffhanger. And I think Lynch and Frost were you're trying to keep that spirit of Twin Peaks alive, so to speak. I know it, it frustrates a lot of people, and I have some very, very good friends who are very, very unhappy about it. And in some cases, they're done with Twin Peaks. They don't, you know, they, they don't want to have anything to do with it anymore, which is a real shame. But I certainly didn't have that reaction. I embrace that ending now. I really like it. There are pieces of the entire 18 hours that when I first saw them, they were extremely frustrating and, and annoying that I've come to now almost appreciate as some of my favorite parts. Part 12, which we all saw up in Washington, was the first time we saw Audrey and she is with her quote-unquote husband, Charlie. <laughs> and we have that long, long 
phone conversation where Charlie's talking to Tina and we don't know what Tina's saying and it ends without us ever finding out. And I remember the people I was with thinking that, oh, that was such a cop out. They really didn't deliver. I've gone back to that scene time and again and I just love that scene now. I love the performance in that scene. I love the suspense of that scene. It's not supposed to give us information. It's That's what it's, it's designed so it won't give us information. Right. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, it's perfect. And so that's the way I feel some about part 18 as I've watched it again that long drive that Cooper and Carrie Page have in the dark where there's no dialogue and they're just driving it, it almost kind of carries you away you, you kind of fall into that you know it's like driving at night we've all we've all done that yeah. you get that rhythm going and it's surreal and I appreciate it for that I think it's really effective and and very powerful that that last hour Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned the Audrey scene. It, it almost does seem like they're foreshadowing, saying, you're not going to tell us? You're not going to tell me who's on the phone? Yeah. You're not going to tell me yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think it makes it easier sometimes, and I appreciate Twin Peaks even more because of the, the articles that you write, John. And, like, you have a new article in the new issue of Blue Rose Magazine, issue five, time and time again. And I actually think it's kind of a, a sequel to an article you wrote years ago and is in, in a central wrapped in plastic book, Half the Man I used to be. I feel like this is almost like a continuation of that article and talking about the split of Cooper's. So thank you for that. I think that's probably true because, um, not because of what I've done, but because I think what Lynch and Frost, and, and maybe a little more Lynch than Frost, were doing in both uh, the new Twin Peaks and in the in episode 29, were really, they were interested in exploring the mind of Dale Cooper and uh, the flawed perhaps the flawed uh, personality of Dale Cooper and what it is that drives him and why he functions the way he does. And I think that explains why he divides in uh, episode 29. He makes some mistakes and he's got his own set of preconceived notions that don't play out and he divides into two people. And I think that was something that Lynch really wanted to explore in all of season three. He wanted to explore who is uh, Dale Cooper, why is he the way he is, and so that is, in many respects, that's what season three is about. I mean, that that's it. So it's Dale Cooper's his psyche come to life. Yeah, and that's kind of the gist of your essay a little bit, is really working through that? There were a couple things I, I was trying to figure out. One of the things that bothered me <laughs> is, it's so funny to say this because it's so minor, but I don't think it, it really is, is that FBI pin. We see on Cooper in part one, and we see it in part two, and a little bit in part three. He's wearing that lapel pin, yes. which disappears when he goes through the socket from the Purple Realm and into the empty house in Las Vegas and essentially becomes Dougie Jones. Everything but his shoes and that pin come through, <laughs> but his suit comes through and he's Dougie at that point. The pin reappears in part 17, right when the, the lights go down in the sheriff's station, Cooper yells to Cole, uh, you know, Gordon, and then it fades to black. And then there's this sort of inky black what Lynch calls Never Never Land in the, uh, in the behind the scenes footage on the, mm -hmm. the Blu-ray. And you see Cooper and Gordon Cole and Diane emerge from the shadow. And, Co and uh, Cooper's wearing that pin again. And then they're in the Great Northern, blah, blah, and everything goes on from there. And he's got that pin on till the end of part 18. I was certain, and I still am, that that was deliberate, that Lynch you know, had the pin on at certain point and, and not at another. And I, I, you know, why, why, why is it there? And why is it not there? And, and going back to that idea I was talking about earlier, of this is all about the psychology of, of Dale Cooper and who he thinks he is and who he really is. I kind of tried to explore what the pin represented and what was going on with Cooper. And so, you know, I guess, you know, ultimately I'm sort of giving away the ending of the essay, but um, I think Cooper is sort of trapped in this um, view of himself as this savior of people who are in danger. And he's he's the hero who will come to the rescue. And he's a special agent uh, of the mm -hmm. FBI. And when he's Dougie Jones, he's not that. He's something else. And so he doesn't have that pin on. And when he's with the firemen at the very beginning of part one he doesn't have that pin on either and so i see the the pin as sort of uh, representation of cooper's you know mind sort of trapping himself in this identity you know until he could take that pin off he's never really going to transcend or or grow or become something else and so that you know, that's a tiny part of the essay um 
I was trying to figure out, you know, what was happening to Cooper between part one and part 18. Uh, the pin was just one avenue into exploring what was going on. I talk about a lot of different things. I talk about Diane and also just the idea of Cooper having left the Red Room, but then coming back to the Red Room and then leaving the Red Room. And I think there's a strong argument that can be made that maybe Cooper didn't physically leave the Red Room until yeah. part 18. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like our friend JC from 25 Years Later might feel the same way. I mean, I think that's interesting. And I've, I've been resisting that for the whole uh, season mm-hmm. three. Like, And I've been calling it the quantum leap the- thing. Like, Even though <laughs> some people say quantum leap, that he actually does leap, his whole body leaps, but I'm not going to get into that. But that whole idea that like his mind goes into somebody else, but his whole body doesn't. And mm. I... I I wrestle with that, especially because I think about, well, they, they said Cooper is, is skinnier than Dougie was, and there, there's some physical you, thing. Yeah, you saw a photo mm-hmm. of Dougie, what he looked like. Or, yeah, or, but, yeah. You know, but, but you go to the doctor's office and you say, oh, you're stronger and skinnier and stuff. And yeah, stuff. So it's, but at the same time, yeah. I love this essay, and, and so much of what you say, John, makes so much sense. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> now, essay. You've actually made me reconsider and <laughs> make me rethink, like, well, maybe there could be a point to this. I don't say I have the answers in this essay at all, but there are some things that they are hard to look away from. Um, and, you know, one in particular is the evolution of the arm telling Cooper, you cannot go out until your doppelganger comes back in. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it, it seems like it's a hard rule, and we almost had that, we have that in Fire Walk with me. I mean, Annie says that, you know, the good Dale's trapped and he can't come out. And she doesn't go as far as to say until the bad one comes in, but it's it's kind of implied that if the bad one's out, the good one can't come back. And so, you know, Mr. C, the doppelganger of Cooper, does not go back in to the lodge until part 17, and you see him in part 18 on fire. And, and so, yes. in effect, you know, that's when he's back in. And it was it's after that that Cooper comes out. I think there's something to that. I don't think we, yeah. we should ignore it. I think there's something you know, critical about that. Um, and also in part two really interesting stuff happens that is easy to overlook and that is when cooper uh, is told by the evolution of the arm to leave he goes down one of the corridors uh, you know between the curtains and he he hits a barrier and he can't get through it and then he goes back and 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 he sees leland and leland says you got to go find laura and so cooper goes to the curtains and instead of parting the curtains as he always does he, he he just sort of fades through them like a ghost he, he doesn't part them right. he, he just sort of disappears and when he comes through on the other side he sees overlapping red rooms as if he's in, as if there's more than one reality mm, there yeah, yeah. and i'm not i'm not sure what it means but it does seem to imply that he hasn't really left the the way we see him leave later or the way we might expect him to exit the red room so whatever that stuff means i think it's important to look at and uh, it's after that point that we have him sort of banished to this place called the non-existent does he physically go does he mentally go does it even matter i don't know but whatever happens between part two and part 17 i'm not sure that it's really it's really cooper or cooper left or whether his mind just left I'm struggling with it too. So this yeah. was an attempt to try to get some of those facts in some order, so we could kind of look at it and and, and come up with a theory or two. Yeah, I, I love your essay, John. Like, I, this is a theory. Um, in the beginning of season three, I was saying, you know, is Vegas all in his head? I had this whole theory about that, and at the end, and reading your stuff, and a lot of just talking to like JC and everybody, it's like a part of me feels. Is this an exaggerated um, thing we watched between those episodes? Was it layers of a psyche? Um, also, there's two things that stick out, and I don't know what you guys think. When you watch behind the scenes, David Lynch is talking to one of the officers, and he discovers, like, we got evidence. And the officer has to say, very exaggerated, it it showed that he had to do this one line like like it felt like thirty times <laughs> and David Lynch is just like you got to say it like like he's like a Broadway show like he's leaning mm-hmm. really low and it's very mm-hmm. exaggerated oh yes that's right yes and yeah to, I remember that part yeah, yeah. To, it's a dream where like yeah. you wouldn't be saying it that way he's almost saying like you're in a Broadway show and then the opening credits were the original series you were in the town you were you were with you know, the river, you were with the water. 
And in this one, you're above everything. You're mm-hmm. above Twin in Peaks. The clouds, in really. the clouds, yeah. yeah you're above yeah. all these little tiny clues. Like you said, you can't ignore them. Sometimes they just get stuck in your head, and you're like, this, this has got to mean something that we're not really in Twin Peaks. We're in somewhere else. I think that's a really good way of looking at it. And the trouble we have sometimes is trying to define it. Maybe, you know, we there there isn't any specific definition. That yeah. idea of just being above it, it may be enough. Yeah, um, yeah. We have a different perspective on whatever it is that we're watching than we might have had in the original series. It is really noticeable to me that... The events that we see transpire between parts, essentially part two and 17, but one as well, are really have a surreal nature to all of it, Mm -hmm. as opposed to what we see in part 18. Although part 18 has a surreal element to it, especially when Cooper and Carrie Page are driving. I mean, that that drive, it it seems like it's a supernatural drive that you go into the dark and they never get on a highway and then they show up at night in Twin Peaks. (laughs) When he's in the bar, when he's in Judy's uh, diner Mm -hmm. and when he's talking to Carrie Page, it's all very, it seems very grounded and Mm -hmm. it seems uh, very, um, it it doesn't have that surreal, I'm not even sure they use, uh, in fact, I don't think they use music at all. There's only a tiny bit of a music cue when they cross the bridge into Twin Peaks. Then you hear a little on ominous music as if well we've crossed a border again when you're watching any episode 12 or 9 or whatever there's odd things that are constantly happening uh-huh. whether or not it's ed's reflection in the mirror that's different than yeah. when you know him sitting there or whether it's the flashing lights on the on the fbi plane or you know red's trick with the dime and and i mean there's just moment after moment like that that have a dreamlike quality um I don't want to go as far as to say it's a dream, but it has a dreamlike feel to it. And uh, there's definitely a dreamlike feel to 18 as well. I don't want to say there isn't, but there's also something really um, gritty about that interaction between Carrie Page and Cooper. It's it's very – it's very real. Uh, it's very serious. What's great about your writing is I feel like your writing always makes me think and I want to mm-hmm. come out with my own theories. And, and it just, I, I just love your style of writing, John. And I was reading your stuff and you know, you're talking about cycles where you know, it seems like Cooper keeps going back into the Red Room and these different cycles. And for some reason I was thinking about uh, the poem, you know, the, the famous Firewalk mm-hmm. with Me poem. You know, through, yes. Through the darkness of future past, the magician longs to see one chance out between two worlds – fire walk with me and i was thinking about cooper you know he goes back is it 17 18 when he goes back into the red room again he's able to part those curtains and he doesn't he just uses his hand and to me he's like a magician and is he actually the one walking through fire like he you know Mm. the whole idea of mr c and him were split up but he was kind of going through this darkness i think you're on to something there i've got notes that i've written down that aren't in this essay maybe a different essay at some point because i mean this was just this was like a first pass at trying to make some sense of it and i have some other ideas that are you know different essays which would probably look at it you know in a different way Way, I do get that sense that Cooper isn't really a full, fully realized person or being or character until later in the story. It's as yeah. if all these experiences had to happen until he could become who he is. And who he is is not the Cooper he was before. I think that may be a mistake we make. Is that, okay, Cooper's back. Yeah. Well, Cooper was back in 17, but the Cooper we see in 18 is a different Cooper. Definitely. And it's almost as if he has evolved into something else. And I think perhaps you know, that's just a step toward a later evolution, that this is, um, uh, this is a new Cooper, but it's not the last Cooper. And so um, I don't, I, you know, again, this is not in the essay, but these are thoughts I've had that you know, as you watch it, you, you get that sense that Cooper is becoming something. And you're right. He uses his hand uh, to part the curtain. It's almost as if he has some magic power at right. that point. It's fascinating it to yeah. think about all that. It really is. We saw Firewalk with me. It ended with Laura in the red room with Cooper by her side. So you think he would know that, like, oh, she's in a good place. Like, every, this, everything happens for a reason, and, it ha- you know, she's where she should be. But it's like Cooper doesn't remember Firewalk Walk With Me. And nobody end. remembers anything I I by the end. Well, uh, you know, that, that that's another great point. And I will point out that Cooper is not wearing the FBI pin in that scene with Laura Palmer. He's not wearing ah. the FBI pin at any part of Firewalk With Me, and right. that may just wow. be because they didn't have 
one. Yeah. But he's not wearing that pin when he's there to comfort her and she sees her angel. Right. Yeah, I guess I was going to go. So, yeah, you, I mean, what I love about your essay is you're talking about cycles and it seems like we're going back. Oh, like, is it future or is it past? And I, you know, I love that in Fire and Walk with Me. I don't know, we can't really count it, but in the missing pieces, we have the little man from another place in the red room talking to Cooper, and you say, is it future or is it past? So at least Lynch has been thinking about this for 25 years. He's been thinking about the idea of, like, timelines. And as I'm reading your essay, I'm kind of thinking, like, are we even talking about last year, 25 years ago, future? Or are we talking about something that's mental? Is it something that, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. That's an excellent point. I mean, I, it could be going on in his mind. He could be trying to manipulate events, you know, uh, in the way he wants them to turn out. You know, they, they can't. He just can't. He doesn't have that control over it. I have thought a little bit about that. And again, this stuff is not in the essay. I hate talking about stuff that's not in the essay. But, you know, a lot of people get, are, are upset or concerned or worried, whatever the word is, for, that, you know, Cooper altered the timeline. And so the events that happened in the original series don't really happen. And I don't subscribe to that viewpoint mm -hmm. of what happened. I, if Cooper really went back in time, and it, it may have been just in his mind, I think he split the timeline into two two timelines so that you have one that goes all the way through Firewalk with me and then you have this other one in which he stopped Laura from from being killed but he can't get her though through the all the way through the woods to the red room or wherever he's taking her she gets whisked away and so you know it could be that she ends up in Odessa Texas there and that that timeline is the timeline now he has to go find her in he has to get to the timeline he created by going back you know and, and altering events he moves into that parallel timeline and and so we still have all the events that happened in the original series all the way through fire walk with me and then we have this other series of events potentially that happened a different way um i like to think of it that way because i don't want to erase everything that happened yeah. you know in in the original series i and I don't think Lynch and Frost did either. Right. I don't think that was their intent. Me neither. You couldn't change things without first having the original series. You know what I mean? Like, like things have to happen in a certain yes, order. Yes, true. Even, right. Even though it's going to hurt your brain. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it has to go in a certain order to be able to, to make the, be where they are now. Yeah. Yeah. You can't I retcon know. the whole thing. Yeah. And be like, oh, it never it happened. Is, it is a head scratcher. Ah, oh, man, there's so many good things about your essay, and I, I love how you look – you kind of reflect on the different characters and how maybe they really do relate to Cooper. And, yeah, it's just – it's really clever. And, and tell me how much – I mean, this does this take you months to come up with? I mean, like, this seems like a really dense, really thought-out <laughs> essay. <laughs> I guess I started in October – and I didn't finish it till the end of January, wow. uh, but it, it changed a lot because as I would get going, I, you know, sometimes I didn't know where I was going to end up. It seems like Cooper in a way. <laughs> you know, I, one of the things that occurred to me as I was writing it was the importance of Diane. And so I have a whole section in here about Diane uh, being a significant character in the story, but maybe maybe somewhat hidden. She plays a really large role in Cooper's life. I believe we get these different versions of Diane. I think NATO is a version of Diane. Yeah. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, obviously she transforms and we get this sort of idealized Diane in the sheriff's station where she's just sort of gung-ho. You know, Cooper, the one and only, and they mm -hmm. kiss and it's like nothing can go wrong. It's very it's very storybook. I would argue that Janie E, we are told, is her half-sister, Diane's half-sister. So she's got a connection to Diane. And I see that as sort of the domestic Diane, who's mm -hmm. sort of this equal partner to Cooper in a, in a life where they've they have a home and they raise a family. And then even Candy, which is almost an anagram of Diane, has that sort of there's something about her that is in tune with other forces. She's not just, you know, ditzy or whatever. She's she's seeing things that no one else can see. She reminds me of Dougie. So Dougie's sort of the, yeah. Yeah, you know, that, that sort of purely good Cooper and Candy could be a purely good Diane, you know. And then, of course, we have a different Diane, I think, you know, the one that he eventually meets in, in Glastonbury Grove when he comes out of the curtains. I think that Diane may be the Diane who has been trying to, from afar in some way, assist him through whatever journey he's going on. Because, how she showed up there in the middle of the night and knew exactly <laughs> to be yeah. there. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you want to think that she had some say in events. She, she knew he was going to come out and, and she wanted to be there for him. That was something I didn't really key in on until I started getting into, in, you know, it, until you start looking at who Cooper is and what kind of character is Cooper. And you realize, oh, 
you know, maybe Diane is the most important person in his life and yeah. he sees her in different ways. You know, he, he, he views her as a different kind of person depending on what Cooper we're looking at. Right. Whether it's Dougie or whether it's FBI Cooper or whether it's a different Cooper altogether. And I think you kind of get at this in your article. It's like The Road Less Traveled. The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveler. Long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay, in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Dougie and his family, and the, this is one way Cooper could have lived his life. He could have he could have retired from the FBI and lived a life with his family. Mm -hmm. And then you have maybe have another Cooper who his he, he just wants to be an FBI agent, and he feels like that is his sole mission in life. I either tweeted this out or talked to somebody recently who you know talking about Part 18, and it's kind of a you know an unhappy ending or a downer or whatever you want to call it, but. Part 18 gives us a very happy ending. I mean, it gives us an extremely joyous ending, and that is when Dougie, whoever that Dougie is, yes. shows up at the front door, and he's greeted by Janie E. and Sonny Jim. And I, we don't know, and I, I, I wish we did, but, you know, it's, that's part of the mystery of the show. Is that – who is that? Yeah. Is that Cooper as Dougie? Is that the Dougie of before who's been you know, rehabilitated in some way? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, who is right? it? It's, it's, it's very, it's, I think I want to believe, and I think that's the beauty of Twin Peaks. You can just sort of believe whatever you want and come away and go, I'm happy now. So mm -hmm. I want to believe that that's Cooper. Huh. That that is Cooper. Yeah. He has returned to the world because Mr. C is gone. He's returned to the world with, uh, with the family that he loves, and he's going to live a happy life now, uh, exactly the way he wants it to be. Meanwhile, another Cooper has moved on to a totally different timeline or world, yeah. still pursuing Laura Palmer. But we got the happy ending, and it's almost hidden. It's almost, you know, just passed right over, but mm. I, I, it's there. Season two, and Cooper's on the floor, and he's dying because he's got shot by Josie. And he's sitting there, and he's talking about all the things he wished he had done. And he's, he's saying, oh, I wish I had a true love. And, and like that's, that's right. all he really wanted was like to have a woman that was there for him that he could love. And I kind of kind of felt like that in season Jane. three, that like maybe whether it's Janie or it's Diane, this idea of, of a, something that you can truly love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, it's interesting that because that season two premiere was directed by Lynch, and I, I should go back and look at the script because Lynch was always tweaking the scripts and adding material to it uh, that wasn't originally scripted, and it's quite possible that he put some of that dialogue in there, and it never left him. That that's that's who Cooper is. That's what he wants. He wants that life, and and I would argue he gets it. In, yes. in season three. This is an excellent article. It is. So and so impressive. And you know what? I'm amazed Blue Rose let you actually have so many pages. I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the funny <laughs> thing is, this was supposed to be the quote unquote commentary section of the episode guide that ah. was in issue four. And I was writing it, and uh, I was, I, I don't remember how many words in, I was like, 1500 words in and scott called me and he said well we need to, you know we need to have this and i said well how much space do you have because we have room for like 1200 words and i said well i'm only just started and it's 1500 words it's going to be a lot longer and so we just bumped it to issue five yeah and i then i had room to explore it and let it find its own way so and then i had more time which was which was better because there was no way i could have done this to get it out in time for issue four yeah. It would have been a different thing, and it, it, I don't think it would have been as good. Although I will say this, um, I'm, and I, I'm the first to admit it, I, have, I really do have a big mistake in this article. Um, I was trying to claim that Cooper's departures from the Red Room happened in a different order than we see them on screen. You know, mm -hmm. he, 
he's sitting there and he sees the one-armed man and he says, is it future or is it past? And then he sees Laura Palmer and the curtains blow back and he sees the white horse and then suddenly he's back again and and the one-armed man is saying, is it future or is it past? And then he goes down and sees the evolution of the arm. And, you know, these, I was saying, well, we're, we're seeing that out of order, but um, it turns out I found some evidence <laughs> I got it wrong. If I ever you know, reprint this, I'll have to go in and yeah, tweak that and fix it. But it, it doesn't take away still from that idea of Cooper's mind and Cooper's psyche and what's happening to him. It, it's just a little path I went down that unfortunately uh, I found out later. Like, oh, there's evidence to refute that. 18 hours is a lot to process. Yeah. You know, there's a scene and I think it's part three where uh, Cooper's sitting in the car with Jade outside the uh, casino. Yeah. And uh, Jade says to Cooper, Dougie, uh, you can go out now. And he looks at her and then he remembers Laura Palmer uh. saying, you can go out now. And that basically defines the order in which those events happen. Yeah. And I was arguing that they may have happened in a different order. If they happened in a different order, he wouldn't have been able to remember that. It's a minor thing. It really is. But um, that's, again, you know, uh, unlike Firewalk With Me or, you know, even Twin Peaks from the original series, there's 18 hours of material there. And it's going to take many viewings, I think, t to really feel comfortable with writing about it yeah. with some authority. And so I appreciate the nice words you've said about this essay. I feel very good about it, but um, there's still a lot that I've got to go back and, and re-examine and process. And that's really exciting. That it's we, very exciting. It's so exciting that like, <laughs> and, and Lynch himself also said that you could almost watch it in different orders and stuff. At least when, when it was first coming out, he was like, oh yeah, you don't have to watch it. I don't know how true that is, but I mean, mm -hmm. you, I still question whether you watch certain things. It's like, is that the right order? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I mean, the fact, there's, it, there's no question that uh, as you watch, and lots of people have pointed this out, the time doesn't seem to pass the way you would expect it to. Yeah. There's a scene where Bobby is talking to Ed and Norma in, in the double R, and he goes, we found something interesting today. Right. But it's been like three or four days since they found that message from Major Briggs. Right. And, you know, you just wonder, did they make a mistake in the editing? And that scene was supposed to take place earlier. Or... Did they say it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter right. because time isn't moving, you know, the way we expect it to. Or are we seeing more than one timeline playing out at once? I, I anyway, I'm going on and on, but I, you I, almost I, could watch it out of order. <laughs> you really could. <laughs> you know, I, I'm hearing all this stuff about issue seven. I think it's the women of Lynch issue seven. Mm -hmm. But I want to know more about issue six because I feel like we're not too far away from issue six coming out. Yeah, issue six. I'm I'm really happy with issue six. It's got a beautiful. Uh, front cover which features the Palmer House uh, on the front. Issue 6 just went to the printer last week and uh, it should be out in early June. Available to anyone who subscribed will be getting it in the mail and of course we'll have issues if people want to buy that single issue it'll be available. Uh, we have some really good stuff in there. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, pieces about uh, the location of the Palmer House. I wrote a short piece about the Palmer House within the story being a haunted house that it it almost is uh, has its own personality, its own sort of negative personality about it. We have an interview with Clark Middleton, who played Charlie in season three. An interview with Michael Horse, an article about him. Awesome. And some other great stuff in there. Oh, we have a really nice piece. If anyone is ever going to travel up to North Bend and the area where they filmed the Twin Peaks, uh, we have a pictorial guide to the locations uh, where things were shot. It's got all the GPS coordinates, so you can plug That's them in. Awesome. And go find where they, you know, shot Jack Rabbit's palace and 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 all that. So wow. it's, it's it's a good issue. Yeah, that's awesome. We just yep. got an email. I was thinking the same thing. Yeah. We just got an email. We haven't gotten back to them yet, but they're going to be making a trip out there, right? Yeah, and, and hopefully it will be in time. They can get this issue. Yes, and it'll get, they can carry it around with them. We just found out today too that we're going to have these copies available for sale in the gift shop at the Salish Lodge. Awesome. So people who are going out there for the summer, whether they're going for the festival or just for their own, you know, their own vacation, um, if they stop in the Sales Lodge, they can pick it up. Uh, you know, a lot of information on where to find different uh, filming sites up there. So. So it's kind of awesome. neat. Yeah, we could have used that. I, we we missed the bus when we were at the festival. And, <laughs> I know. I mean, Scott was nice. Actually, Scott took us to uh, Ronette's Bridge, and we did go check out some places. We but had a good there's, time. There's a few places we missed, and if we had had the guide, if we, if we could, <laughs> you know. Well, we got we got to see some stuff nobody did. else did. That's so. really cool. But yeah, yeah, yeah. but I def that is awesome. I can't wait. I 
I can't wait to get it in the mail. And I it. know. I love it. I love it. I, and I take my time reading it. I'll read every weekend. I'll read uh, one or two articles. Yeah. We have a short, short piece by uh, John Piricello, who played Chad. Ooh, he, nice. he wrote us a, a short piece. And I, I can't say it's very short. It, you know, it's not any major piece, but it's really interesting. So I'll just say that. That's all right. <laughs> I can't wait he's, for a, that. he's a great guy. He really something. Well, thank you so much, John. Can, can you tell us how uh, we can follow you and, and any more information? Uh, yeah, well, the Blue Rose, you, know, can, you, go to, uh, you can go to the website, bluerosemag.com, if you, you know, want to find out about the magazine and subscribe or get single issues. We do have issue seven in the works right now. That's the Women of Lynch issue. It's an extra larger size, well, I mean, thicker, more pages, and um, uh, lots of good stuff going to be in, in that issue. Um, you can follow me uh, on Twitter, uh, which is at thornwhip, W-I-P. If anyone's still interested in my book, The Essential Wrapped in Plastic, it's available on Amazon. Such a great book. I love it. I've got it on digital and I've got a physical (laughs) copy. I love that book. It's so good. And I'm going to put out an audio version for you, Ben. Yes, so please you can do. Get that Come one on. That would be awesome. I would love <laughs> oh, that. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, and, you know, talk about Women of Lynch, that uh, issue seven. If, I, if I'm right, if you buy it uh, individually, it's going to cost you more, and it would be cheaper for you if you got the subscription, the year subscription. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. If you buy, if you have a subscription, you're going to get a good deal because we're going to have a different cover stock. going to be more pages for sure, so it would cost more. It's going to cost us more to print. It's going to cost us more to ship. All, all of that good stuff. So if you already have a subscription, it's no extra charge. You just get it in the mail, and you can still, you know, buy a subscription and and get uh, the other issues and that one too. If you're going to buy it individually, it will cost a little more. Yeah. So just get a awesome. subscription. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. <laughs> we have great stuff lined up for issue eight. Scott and I were talking about it today. So we've got, you know, I think we've got a really solid issue eight coming as well. Wow. And that'll be that'll be later, you know, in the fall. Yeah, and I think every issue has been solid. And sometimes yeah. I don't want you to give us tell us anything ahead because I'm already waiting for six and now I know about seven and I have to wait for six. <laughs> and now eight, you're teasing eight. Don't tease eight. Oh. I just want to, oh. <laughs> Thank you, John. And if you want to send us an email at Twin Peaks Unwrapped at gmail.com. Uh, like us on Facebook at Twin Peaks Unwrapped. Ben is always hanging out on the old Twitter at Twin Peaks Unwrapped. And Brian's on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. We're getting tons of likes. We're, get, we're getting um, comments and questions. And we'll get to all that in a future episode. We've just been so busy. And you can find us at, uh, on YouTube at Twin Peaks Unwrapped. Subscribe. We're out of here. See you next week. See you next week. Today, we're inviting you to join us in making a feature-length documentary, I Know Catherine, the Log Lady, because the show must go on. Hi, I'm Richard Green. I know Catherine from the Eraserhead days. She introduced me to David Lynch, and years later, she helped him find me from Mulholland Drive. No, I, Banda! Around that same time, Catherine helped us produce David Lynch Presents I Don't Know Jack, the unsolved life and homicide of Eraserhead star and Catherine's first husband, Jack Nance. When I heard that Catherine died four days after shooting her last Log Lady scenes, a character who was also dying, I knew we had to tell this story. And when David spoke to me so intimately about Catherine, I knew we had a story to tell. And when I found out that Catherine's 22 seasons at the OSF, one of the greatest repertory theaters in the world, were on video and we secured the rights to that video, I knew we could tell this story in a way that had never been done before. I'm Jenny Sullivan. I know Catherine. She was my oldest friend in life. Her closest family and friends and I have gathered together and never before seen photos and footage. She conquered the stage, the screen, and pioneered a path for herself into the male-dominated world of cinematography. Hi, I'm Cameron Dexter. And I'm Amanda McHugh. And we know Catherine through her life's work on screen. This is the story of a woman that needs to be told. And this is a chance for all of us to tell it together. Your support will help her colleagues from Twin Peaks, the theater, and behind the camera share their stories like David Lynch has done. Become a backer and help us pay for Catherine's filmed stage performances, as well as actual incredible footage from Twin Peaks. And the funds for graphics, editing, and music. We support the David Lynch Foundation, the OSF Catherine Coulson Welcome Fund, and Tree People. So choose from some of these amazing rewards. We'll find out what it was like on the set as two great artists 
said goodbye for the last time to the words and emotions of a character they created together. What was it about Catherine that moved so many people so deeply? It's beautiful that um, people say she was their best friend and felt the same way. It's this great. That's Catherine. I know Catherine, the log lady. Help us put on the show. Together, we can make this film.